you may not be able to relate with you may not be able to relate with every single missionary but at, I, my prayer is that you can relate with at least one of them and by the end of the course uh, i want you to be educated but as the bible says education without charity uh which is practice is worthless you know what good is it to know that you're saved if you can't help somebody else towards salvation. So the idea of this course is to learn about missionaries and how they were used of God, but also to be able to maybe see a particular missionary and say, wow, that man reminds me a lot of me. And maybe I can use this man as an encouragement to help me when I go through hard times. Because the, the biographies are not gonna just be the highlights, it's also gonna be some of the struggles. Uh, there's one particular man in this course, his wife went uh, medically, mentally insane, and she would stand outside at the front of her house and she would yell to all the people that walked by that his that her husband was crazy and that her husband was um, a liar. And that was very hard on the individual because he had to continue to be faithful. And in fact, one of his friends told him, you need to put your wife away in a hospital and forget about her so that you can do the work of God. And this man prayed on it. And he said, there's no way I could leave my wife. My wife came with me to this country and I will die with my wife, regardless of the circumstances that may come. And so that shows you the faithfulness, the testimony of an individual that wasn't interested in just doing a work for God, but also being there for his family as well. And as men that are being used by God and ladies in this class, I want to encourage you, continue to do the work of God, but also make sure to take care of your family. Make sure to go spend time with your family. If you have young ones, I praise God, my, my son, he's seven years old. He's called to be a missionary already. And I told my son, I would never call you because if I call you, then someday you'll say, oh, well, daddy, you called me. And so I'm not supposed to be missionary. But uh, because he's called, I want to always make sure that God sent him to me to minister to him as well. And many times we get so busy in the ministry that we forget our children. Our children want to play soccer, football, or they want to uh, maybe ride the bicycle and we get too busy. Oh, I don't have time for that. Well, listen, there's going to be a time where that child is not going to have time for you and they're not going to have time for the things of God. And some of the people in these biographies, as I've done studies, some of their worst enemies ended up being their children. And it was because the children ended up hating God. They ended up hating the ministry. They hated church. And really, it was all. So let's always keep our families as the first ministry. But I believe God has given us the opportunity to have a balance. And so let's be balanced. Let's let's help people. But let's also help. Uh, the ones that God has given us first. What does the Bible say? How can you truly be a pastor? How can you truly be a minister if you can't take care of your own house? And so if you see if you see some hardships in your life that's taking place, I hope that this, this course will be a blessing. Maybe there's something they did in their lives that you can say, wow, I can do that in my life and it will help with my situation as well. So I hope that's the case. Now, I'm going to try to throw... I, I am not completely familiar with this. Let's put up here. Can everybody see it now? The uh, lesson? Or do they still see me? Dr. Victor, can, what, what do you see on your end? Can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. What do you see on the screen? Just me? Oh, lesson one, see this uh, stood. And that's, okay. uh, yes. So only that, or do you see me as well? Oh, you're on mute. We, we see, we see two pages. Okay, so maybe yeah. I'll go back and forth. 
Can you see me now? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll go back and forth. I'll read some and then I'll come back to the screen so you can see me. But the first, the first missionary we're going to speak on is C.T. Studd. Now, for a show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of this missionary? Raise your hand. No. Nope. Well, that's that's good. So we get to meet a new individual. C.T. Studd, I think, will be an encouragement to you. Uh, it's not as um, recognized in America, but C.T. Studd was one of the best cricket players during his time. Now, if we were to talk about a cricket player today, it would be a cricket player that everyone would know, not just India, but the world that plays cricket. What would be a name of someone? Could anybody tell me? I'm on mute. Tell me of a name. Let me think. Uh, main thing. Do you know a cricket player that's famous that would be known in England, Australia? No, Pastor Rajan, do you know? What about uh, Dr. Victor? Do you know of someone, somebody that's famous, needing some help? <laughs> Uh oh, nobody knows. Pastor Wilson, do you know? What about Vijay? No, sir. What is a cricket player that you know? What did you say? Oh, it's, 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 it's. What's the name? I couldn't hear him. Sir, Indian cricket player, we know. We can say Indian. Okay. Yes, sir, we well, say... a famous one. Famous one day. I guess I could Google yeah. it. Let me see. Yes, Indian but... famous cricket player is name is Dhoni. MS Dhoni. Okay, so everybody knows him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? Yes, sir, yes. Okay, what about, let me see here. What about Virat Kohli? He's from Bangalore. Yes, sir. He also very good. Yes. Yeah. What yes, about uh, Sachin uh, Tin Tendulkar yeah. from Sachin Mumbai? Sachin Tendulkar, yeah, Indian okay. player. Okay. So these are names that, if I said it, this guy, right? This missionary was not just known as a religious, important person. This man was the best cricket player when he was alive and he was playing cricket. And we're going to talk about that. But let me let me share the screen. Uh, now, understand, I actually have, so you can pray for it as well, uh, I'll be teaching in our college here in Texas at 10 o'clock my time, which is when we cut off. So do pray. I have many potential missionaries that are going to be going to the mission field, and we're going to be teaching on how to have the right relationship with pastors and with nationals when they go to the countries that they're going to. So how can you work with the nationals? You know, I was in Korea. This is a side note I just want to mention. I was in Korea. I met a man uh, in Korea, and he said he was called to um, be a missionary, I mean, to be a pastor in Korea. Uh, but later on, he ended up not becoming a pastor. So I asked the American missionary, I said, what happened? What? He had such a desire to be a pastor, and now he has no desire. And he told me there was an American, this American went to Korea and he told the Korean young man that was at the church, he said, I want an American washing machine. I want an American fridge. I want American sofa. I want nothing that's Korean. The Korean stuff is junk. I don't like the Korean stuff. And he just was always talking bad about the Korean that the Korean man got discouraged. And he said, I don't want a pastor because I guess God can't use Koreans. And so this new American that was there, he was encouraging him. And he said, God can use you. 
God can use you. Sometimes there's crazy people in the world. They don't understand, but you know, I understand God can use you. And now today he's a pastor and we praise God for that. Well, that's what we're going to be doing at 10 o'clock. I'm going to be teaching the young men and the young ladies how to have the right relationships with pastors. There's this mindset sometimes, I don't know why, but that's why I'm my, my desire is to teach this out of it. But there's this mindset that only the Americans can do something for God. And can I tell you that you as nationals can do 10 times more than I could ever do. And the reason why is because you have the understanding of the culture you know the language. There's a difference between learning a language and knowing the language. God can use you in a mighty way. And so we've got to be willing to have a partner. Partner in there's things that can bring that can be a blessing to you. And there's things that you have that God has given you that can be a blessing to me. And so we partner for God, just like we partner with Jesus when it comes to the gospel. So let's go ahead and go to the screen. I'm going to throw it back up here. And lesson one, CT stud. So we see here, uh, Charles Thomas Stud, that was his full name. He was born in 1860 to one of the wealthiest families of England during his time. He was the third oldest son and was an upcoming cricket star. While at Eton School, CT Stud and his two older brothers had the opportunity to play on the same team. Shortly after the announcement of their cricket opportunity, their father, Edward, wrote a letter asking them to travel back to London to meet with him. Upon arrival, Edward, which is C.T. Studd's father, was excited to take his boys to a performance or what we would call a theater or a show. Little did they know this event would change the course of C.T. Studd at the time 17 years old. The performance happened to be a revival meeting hosted by D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the name D.L. Moody? I'm sure that it's very, very uh, famous, popular. But D.L. Moody was a great preacher of the Bible, of the gospel. And so he was already having a meeting. And this, uh, this father asked his son to come see the meeting. Well, why? He wanted him to have the gospel, to get saved. And although C.T. Studd and his brothers did not get saved during the meeting, there was a clear change in their father's life. You see, the dad ended up getting saved. And I understand this guy is very wealthy. This would be like, uh, let me think, this would be like Bill Gates, or it would be like, um, uh, let me see here. Let me, let's try to make this uh, most famous businessman in India. It would be like um, Mukesh Ambani. Um, you know, a, a very, very wealthy family. Can you imagine if Mukesh was to get saved, but not just get saved, this man got so changed that he ended up giving his house as a place for uh, preaching on Sunday. He would invite preachers that came through and he said, look, I want you to preach the gospel so that people can get saved. And he had this mansion, huge building. And he would have them share the gospel inside of his mansion. And uh, so let's continue. So it says here, due to Edward, the father's life being changed, he sold all of his race horses. Now, I heard the other day there was this race horse that was sold. Now, I don't know how much it would be in rupee, but it was 700,000 U.S. dollars for one horse. Now, these horses, they're so expensive because they are bred through a specific line of horses. So that, that they can have the genes of strength and speed and performance. But I can only imagine all of these racehorses that he sold was a lot of money. Not just a lot of money, but he was able to give it for the gospel. But he also turned his home into a place for additional Bible study and church services. It was because of these church services that C.T. Studd would reluctantly get saved along with his two older brothers. At first, this new change in the boy's life seemed fruitful, both spiritually and relationally. They all attended the older brother's Bible studies while at Eton School. So when the oldest son, C.T., ended up getting saved, he went back to his school and he told his school, he said, I want to have a Bible study. I want to have a Bible club. And he started a Bible club. And then the other brothers decided to be a part of it. 
Everything was going well for young CT until his oldest brother moved off to Trinity College in Cambridge. Now, that was a very famous college. The lack of fellowship began to affect CT stud. That's why it's so important. Understand the Christian, the Christian ministry is not just about knowledge. It's also about fellowship. Many times, as the Bible says, much learning doth make you mad. You can become so intellectual that you're good for nothing. We need to always be students of the Bible, but we need to apply what we learned. Otherwise, the application will make us enemies of God. God doesn't teach us so that we can walk around and be smart. God teaches us so that we can be a blessing to others. And so here's a young man that not it's not the older son's fault he ended up needing to go to college but we see here here's a young man that's starting to have spiritual problems in his life because he has no one to fellowship with you know when you go through a hard time you need men to comfort you and to give you uh, encouragement and how many people walk through their life busy and life is busy but didn't even recognize that the oldest son was important to ct studs life and can you imagine, here's a missionary that Satan could have destroyed um, if God hadn't intervened. So let's be mindful. Just because we see a young individual and they look okay, oh, they look okay, they're not sad. That doesn't mean they're, they, they could very well be struggling in their life with something. And so we need to be mindful of always encouraging people because everyone is having a hard time. Everybody's having a hard time. And so we need to be there for people, both in the good times and in the bad times. But the lack of fellowship began to affect C.T. Studd spiritually, and he started quitting attending Bible studies and began filling it with athletics. Nothing wrong with exercise. I need to get back to exercising. I'm sure Dr. Victor and the others can, can see I've put on a little bit of some weight, so I need to get back. In. But here in, uh, in Dallas, it's the same heat as it is in Delhi right now. It's like 107 degrees outside, so it's hard to, to barely walk without sweating. But anyways... He, he started to fill it with um, athletics rather than be uh, doing Bible. And you could tell he's starting to backslide. Uh, it says here, you got a little picture of his cricket team there, the gentlemen of England. But it says after finishing the school there, C.T. Studd enrolled at Trinity College as well. Now, why? I think possibly because his brother was there. And you could tell this man was, a, was an individual. He wasn't a very independent person. He was a person that loved to be around his family. And there's nothing wrong with that. Again, there's different personalities. And if you're of someone like this, then this could be a blessing to hear of his life. But once again, the three bro brothers were on the same cricket team and they were tremendous assets to the cricket program. The university team was so skilled that they were challenged. And they were so skilled that they were Australia that was currently undefeated at the time. So here is an undefeated professional cricket team that has invited a college level cricket team to come play. And to everyone's surprise, the undefeated Australians were defeated by this college uh, cricket team. CT Studd was truly gifted in cricket and was on track for a promising future. As published about C.T. Studd in the book, Lily White's Cricket Record, this is what it says, very few players have a finer style. Now, okay, before I read this, I want everybody to know, I have watched a little bit of cricket. I enjoy it. Um, the game is intriguing to me. But I know nothing about terms. Like if I were to tell you American football terms like a punt, or a tackle, or a pass, you know, you may not know that. So a lot of this, I don't really understand, but many of you may know a little bit more, and so you could help me if this, if this statement is a pretty good statement. But it says here, very few players have a finer style. They have what's called, he has what's called brilliant leg hitting and driving. So I guess that's good, but uh, with a very hard wrist stroke in front of point, a real straight bat, I guess that means he, he hit it really well, and a resolute nerve to make together a batsman whose back, let me throw it back, 
who's bat who's back bowlers are very glad to see. So again, I don't know much about that, but I do know that he was very well known. Um, CT Stud was invited on multiple occasions to play for the English national cricket team and even became a household name. He was known everywhere, not only in England, but also in Australia and around the world. Soon would he realize how quickly fame can vanish. George Stud, Stud one of CT Stud's older brothers, was diagnosed with pneumonia and was on his deathbed when CT Stud began to question the purpose of his life. And, you know, sometimes I pray this. You see a lot of famous people in life and you say, oh, I wish they weren't famous. I don't wish that. I think sometimes fame can bring people to Christ. Because when you have a lot of things and you're on your deathbed, you begin to question what was the whole point of my life? You see, when you don't have much, then to die, it's it doesn't necessarily mean much. But an individual that has a lot of money, what good was it? You know, it's like Solomon said, vanity of vanities. I have everything, but now the one thing I need is life, and I don't have life. And so here's a here's a young man that's got a lot of fame, very wealthy, very important. Everybody knows him. And now his older brother is has pneumonia, is about to die, and he begins to question, what is the point of even playing cricket? Like, who cares if everybody knows me if I'm no longer living? And so this began to be a big issue in his mind. We see here in the in the curriculum, he began to ask himself, what is the purpose? Why even live to be famous when he stands before God? What good is it? God could care less if he's a cricket player. How quickly life was passing for his brother George to relish in this temporary fame. When George began to slowly regain his health, C.T. Studd was thankful for God's mercy on his brother. You see, I believe God didn't want to get rid of George yet. I think God just used him as an opportunity to uh, be able to um, make C.T. Studd a little more serious in his life. You know, one of the things I think uh, that's different about America than the rest of the world. America does not see death very often. You see, when somebody dies, we put them in a casket and they look beautiful and happy. And then when they pass away, it moves on. And the, what I'm trying to say is in India, I've seen young, young children pass away. I've seen older people pass away. I've seen it happen in the Philippines. And what that does is it makes an individual have to relook at themselves and say, is there really something after this life? And I think a lot of Americans, especially the children, they're so caught up in video games and having fun that what happens is they never really sit down and they think about what happens after I die. And so I think it's important for you to have not necessarily morbid, you know, I'm not saying kids need to see somebody with his guts hanging out and his head halfway off. I'm not saying that, but I am saying we should never we should never remove our children from death because death is real and death is going to lead somebody to the opportunity to begin to think on, hey, there's going to be a day where I'm not going to be here. And maybe I need to confront my life with God as, as far as if I'm saved and if I'm going to go to heaven. But we see he was thankful for the mercy on his brother. It's quite evident that God used this opportunity to mature C.T. Studd into the man that he would use for his glory and purpose. You see, overwhelmed with thankfulness for George's recovery, C.T. Studd began attending. Here we go. Remember Dale Moody? So he's back. So here he is. He's now wanting to get to know him. Well, why is he wanting to get to know him? He's wanting to get to know him because he realized C.T. Studd has something that he's missing. And that's not just Christianity. How many people go to church but aren't saved? How many people believe in God but don't know if they're going to heaven? I just talked to someone last Saturday. I asked them, I said, do you know for sure that if you were to die, you'd be in heaven? And this is what they said. Well, I hope so. I love God. But they didn't know. You see, hoping, loving, praying, that doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. And so it's important that we understand that C.T. Studd, I'm sure, was grateful that his dad got saved, but it didn't become personal yet until now. And so now that it's personal, he's he's out here looking for D.L. Moody. He wants to get he wants to get to meet him again because he's serious about it now. 
So it says he began attending the Al Moody's meetings, and now a fire begins to consume his heart. He began inviting his cricket team members to attend the meeting. So now all of his very wealthy friends. As his friends began trusting Christ as their Savior, C.T. Studd realized his purpose in life and began walking. C.T. Studd's life changed to that of reaching everyone he could with the gospel. On Saturday, November 1st, 1884, C.T. Studd felt the Lord's call on his life to go to China. So now we hear his calling. He's going to be a missionary to China. After hearing missionary John McCarthy's testimony, although this decision came with many trials and hardships, C.T. Studd was reminded of Psalms chapter 2, verse number 8. So this is something you may want to remember for a test. It may be on the test. But it says here, uh, this is what led C.T. Studd to becoming a missionary. And this is what it says in Psalms 2, 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now, if that was a good verse for C.T. Studd to surrender his life to for China, maybe is that a good verse for you that are in India and all areas? Uh, there are not many heathen in India. Very much so. Now, does God hate the heathen? No, the Bible says that God has a desire that all come to repentance, that all get saved, for God so loved the world. But why is it that India has not been with the gospel? Well, maybe it's because of Psalms chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible says that if you ask God, he will give you the heathen for your inheritance. That means, spiritually speaking, if you'll ask God, God will begin to allow you to see other people come to the knowledge of the Savior and to get saved. And they'll no longer be heathen. And it was that verse right there that C.T. Studd said, this is more important than cricket. This is more important than fame. If I just simply ask God, God will give and not just give, he'll do a work in me that will be remembered, not for the sake of remembering and for the sake of fame, for the sake of prayer. And so that was a very powerful verse in his life. You know, something's happening in our lives, and because something's happening in our lives, the next thing is the verse pops out, and you've read the verse a hundred times, but because of something happening in your life, it becomes very powerful. And so this was powerful during C.T. Studd's life. But we see here when C.T. Studd made it to China, you see that picture right there. It's a very small picture, probably uh, missions in regards to uh missions in in england ct stud had a different approach you see most british missionaries would go to different countries like china and india and they would wear the shirt and the tie and they'd wear the suit coat and they would look british the problem was in china china looked at foreigners the white people they called them the foreign devils or the white devils and they would tell their people, especially in villages, they would say, do not allow the American missionary or the British missionary to come into your home because if, if you allow them, then they will steal your children and they will eat them because they're cannibals. None of that was true, but there was a complete difference. And C.T. Studd knew that if I keep dressing like this British uh, missionary, I'm never going to be able to reach the people that are in the village. And so he began to dress like the Chinese so that the Chinese would not be so scared, scared of him. And can I tell you, that was a lot of people hated that. In fact, there was a lot of missionaries in China when he was in the big city, Shanghai, when he would walk down the street. If a missionary was walking on the same street and they saw C.T. Studd dressed like a Chinese, they would go to the other side of the road and they would walk on the other side of the road because they believed that C.T. Studd was doing uh, the work of God against God. They were, they were against him for doing that. Now, uh, everybody, that the man that walked across the street because he was upset with C.T. Studd, nobody remembers him. But everybody remembers C.T. Studd. And it's because C.T. Studd, listen, this is, this is how you will be remembered in life. People will not remember what you wear. People will not remember what you said. People will remember your heart because it's the heart that connects with people. 
You see, if I come into a country and I tell a country how important I am and how great I am and how many people I've led to the Lord and how big of a church I've pastored, they will remember it for a short time. But the bigger thing they will remember is how well I interacted with them and I cared about them and I loved them. One of the things I try to do, and I, I may because I go to so many countries, I'm not able to do really much more than this, but I do try to learn the language of, of very common terms. You know, when I go to the Philippines, I'll say salama and I'll say magandang araw. And when I do that, I watch the nationals look at me and they say, wow, because so many Americans, when they come, they come as tourists and they come demanding. And hey, you come over here because I have money. I, it's not about the money. It's about the heart. And C.T. Studd knew that unless the only way I'm going to reach these people is if I come down to their level and remember what Paul said, to be all things to all men. That doesn't mean compromise. You can't tell somebody in, uh, in a, a village in India that, well, you can believe in Krishna and go to heaven also, or you can believe in Gandhi and go to heaven. No, no, no. We can't compromise. But, um, you know, you, can, you, you don't have to look like this individual that's a foreigner. You can try to learn some of their language, learn some of their culture and try to become as them because that's endearing, you know, it's endearing. Uh, and it's definitely a blessing. You see, let's continue. It says when CT stud made it to China, he and the other six men that went with him had a wonderful opportunity to work alongside Hudson Taylor. Uh, after learning the language and becoming aware of Chinese customs, the Cambridge seven, that's what they're known as split up into two groups and began doing evangelistic work in different regions of China. While in China, C.T. Studd met a young lady by the name of Priscilla Stewart, who had surrendered her life to the mission field. Now, understand, C.T. Studd right now is single. He's not married. But he meets this girl named Priscilla. And you know, when, uh, many of you that are married now, when, you first, when I first met my wife, I started having some butterflies in my stomach and it wasn't because of the pizza that I ate. It was because she was pretty. And so here's this young lady named Priscilla. But what was pretty to C.T. Studd was not just that she was a pretty girl, but also she'd given her life to the mission field. Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of young ladies, even in our Bible colleges in America, that when I surrendered to go to the mission field, if I had married some of the young ladies, they wouldn't go to the mission field. So it's very important. If you're still single today, make sure you marry the right person. The lady in your life is a help meet. We see that Eve was created to help Adam fulfill the purpose in his life. And I know of several, I know of several young men that are called to be pastors, but they married the wrong person. And now they're not pastors. They never became pastors. And they're out of the ministry. And a lot of them are not even in church today. So be careful. Please be careful. There's so many young men that I counsel with. And all oh, this girl's so pretty. Well, she'll be pretty. But pretty isn't just looks. Pretty is that attitude. It's a heart. And that heart of a desire to serve God. And this guy, C.T. Studd, recognized that. And that's another reason why I think he's so successful. Because he was successful because he surrendered his life to God. But not only did he surrender his life to God. He, he made sure to one of the biggest decisions in your life is marrying the right lady. It would be better for you to not get married than to marry the wrong person. Because if you marry the wrong person, your life will be complete enmity, just fighting all day long because you're trying to go one way and the lady doesn't want to go the one way. So we see here this lady had a desire to serve the Lord in the mission field. At first, C.T. Studd did not appreciate Priscilla surrendered to China because of how frail she was physically. She was very sick. She uh, had a lot of health problems. But it did not take long for C.T. Studd to realize what she lacked in physical health she made up for in a passion to see souls saved. She wanted people to come to get saved. This desire impressed C.T. Studd so greatly that he would later in life ask her to be his bride. Together, as they said their vows in China, they promised that they would never hinder each other from doing the work of God. And so that's a blessing there. Now, let me make sure I go to the, there we go. 
while serving in China. And so the way this this curriculum is broke up, uh, understand this uh, this curriculum is not just reading a whole bunch of stories because that would be boring. I know it's very hard right now because we're reading it, but I have also, so the next lesson, I'm taking little portions of CT Studs Life and I'm making practical illustrations. So there'll be some spots here that kind of focus on. And then even if you're able to print the uh, copy, uh, I sent it to Dr. Victor. So if you'd like to print it from your house, uh, you can fill in the blanks. That's give you some uh, ability not to just sit there. And I know, I know how it is. You're all busy and you're doing ministries and to just listen to speaking because can sometimes get a little draining, uh, especially on a screen. And so it's not going to be this way nonstop. It's just, we're reading the, a very short biography of them, but I do want to say, and it may be in the, the practical part, but, but here's another thing that's not written here. Both of them didn't like each other. And what I mean by that is they both thought each other were ugly. So like, <laughs> I'm not saying to marry somebody you think is ugly. Uh, yeah, of course, you know, if you find a pretty girl that loves the Lord, that's good. But realize, even though they both didn't like each other, they both thought each other were ugly. They knew that China, and I think India is the same way also. A lot of your Asian countries are big on family. And China is very big on family. And they recognize, CT Stud realized, I am not going to be able to pastor these people as a single man because they're going to have questions as far as children, as far as family. And so they were willing, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just telling you, these are things that he believed and he did, and it could be why he's successful. But both of them, even though they thought each other were ugly, they were willing to forget about looks and they were willing to look at the ministry. They both had a desire to see China saved. They both had a desire for to see China become Christian. And so even though they thought each other were ugly, they got married so that they could be able to be that pastor and that pastor's wife that could show the Chinese families how to live a Christian life as a family. And then they ended up having children as well. And God used it um, in a mighty way. Now, again, I'm not saying that's necessarily what you should do. I'm just saying that's what happened in their life. Neither one of them liked each other, but they decided that this would be the best for the ministry. And because of that, God used it. But let's continue on. So we see here, while serving in China, they faced many trials, but the Lord always blessed their faithful faith and obedience. They were blessed with five children, although their oldest and only son, Paul, lived for only a few hours. He didn't live very long. C.T. Studd and Priscilla served in China for 10 years before returning to England due to C.T. Studd's health, his asthma. So he went back to England to try to recover some of his breathing. He was having struggles with breathing. And you know preachers and, and missionaries and ministry workers, if you don't have a voice, it's hard to do ministry. And uh, he couldn't breathe, so he went back to try to recover. While recovering, C.T. Studd began encouraging everyone he met about the need for missionaries in China. This led to many surrendering. And it also led to an invitation for C.T. Studd to travel for the first time to America and to raise awareness as well. After traveling back and forth in America and also England, the Stud family would pack their bags. And this time, and this is why I'm, I'm interested, uh, he went to India. And so many of you said you've never heard of him. Now, he didn't go to India for very long, but he was in India. So this is a hero of yours. Uh, this is one of the men that came to your country, uh, many of you, and, and ministered there and was a very, very famous individual. But he went to India. He did not go back to China. He went to India for six years, but had to return back to England due to CT Studs asthma. And as many times as I have been to India, I can completely understand why he was having breathing problems because there is a lot of pollution in India, that's for sure. Um, so and and China. China has a lot of pollution as well. Uh, England is not necessarily clean, but it's cleaner than the China and India for sure. But while back in England, the Lord used CT Stud once again to inspire many other people to full-time service for God. Now think with me for a second before we continue on. Understand that if, uh, if CT Stud was healthy his whole life, can you imagine? Think with me for a second. Many times we get so stuck in this little uh, box 
of what we think God wants us to do. And we get discouraged. Oh, God, God wants me to be a pastor. And then you get sick and you're not able to pastor the way that you wanted to pastor. And then you get to say, well, God can't use me. Now, listen, think with me for a second. Let's say CT Stubb didn't have the asthma. Let's say he stayed in China all of his life. Let me ask you a question. How much of India would be missing the gospel because of CT Stud not being able to go there? Here's another question. It was CT Stud's asthma that caused him to go back to England. It caused him to go to America. How many young men would not have become missionaries, would not have gone to China and India and all around the world if CT Stud did not have asthma? That's why the Bible says, do not, don't get upset with God. It's okay. It's okay to ask God questions sometimes. It's okay to say, God, why is this happening in my life? But it's not okay to tell God, God, you're wrong. Because God knows what he's doing. God used C.T. Studd's health to get the gospel out more. Because C.T. Studd can only be in one place. But because he was able to encourage and recruit more missionaries, now CT Stud's able to be all around the world, and it's because of his health. So what I'm saying is if you're struggling with some issues in your life right now personally, and you feel like, God, I, it doesn't make sense. This is so confusing. I thought you wanted me to do this in my life. Can I say God always knows what he's doing? So don't get discouraged. Keep your head high. I know without a doubt God used it for his glory even though C.T. Studd, I'm sure, was getting irritated because why do I keep having to go back? How can I do ministry if I keep having to go back? So don't get discouraged. God knows what he's doing. Just stay yielded to God's will in your life. Let's continue. It says here, while back in England, the Lord used C.T. Studd once again to inspire many people to full-time service for God. As much as he loved inspiring others to live for God, C.T. still had a strong longing for mission work. He still wanted to be overseas. This time, the Lord led him to Africa. So this man here has been all around the world now. Um, and, and that's another side note I want you to think about. During this uh, course, I want you to see how God used all of these men, not just in one place. Many times we think that God wants us as missionaries to stay in one area, and to do the work in one area all the rest of the days of our lives. But that's not always how God works. Sometimes God wants you to go to another area and go to another area and go to another area. And if you will notice, a lot of these men that God used and are famous men in America and in England and some of the people even you may know, they are recognized because they went not just one place, they went everywhere. One of the biggest struggles I have as a missionary when I go to churches in America, I'll go to a church in America, I'll ask for them to partner with me so that they can help with the finances for me to go. You know, I, I'm praying about next year going to see Dr. Victor again in India and uh, as well as Dr. David, uh, but that takes money. And I'll go to these uh, churches and I'll ask the church if they'll help sponsor the trip. And many of them will tell me no, and they'll tell me no because they say, we support missionaries that only stay in one area, one country. But the question is, you remember Philip? Philip was at the day of Pentecost, and then God wanted him to go to the desert. Now, can you imagine? Here you are, a missionary, going to churches, trying to raise support to go to the desert. How many churches would support you? Here's a pastor. They say, how many people live in the desert? Well, no one lives in the desert. Okay. How much money do you need? I'm going to lead a lot of money. You know, it costs a lot of money because there's no businesses there. Everything has to be brought in. And you imagine how many pastors would have said no. But you know what happened? This man was lit by faith. He went, even when it didn't make sense. And he met the, remember, he met the eunuch. And the eunuch, a lot of people don't know what happened. Everybody knows what happened in the Bible. He got saved. He got baptized. He went back to his country. But nobody knows what happens after that. Well, what happened is he went back to Ethiopia. He led. There was a there was a great awakening. Many people got saved in Ethiopia. Not just many people. The queen got saved. Queen Sheba. Queen Sheba got saved. She declared that the 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 main religion for Ethiopia is going to be Christianity, and that Christianity needs to be preached throughout all of Ethiopia. Okay. So they start getting saved. 
Well, guess what? It's not done yet. I, many got saved. They read their Bible. And remember in the Bible, it says, do good to your enemies to give them water when they're thirsty. Well, Muhammad, the, the founder of Muslims, Muhammad was in the desert. He was thirsty. He was almost about to die. There was an Ethiopian man that went to Muhammad and he told Muhammad, he said, here's some water because he remembered that passage in scripture. And you know what Muhammad did? Muhammad wrote in the Quran, the Quran. He wrote, do good to the Ethiopian because he took care of me when I was thirsty. And so you know what's happening today in Ethiopia? In Muslim mosques all over Ethiopia, they're allowing Christians to have their church services in the mosque rent free. They don't have to pay anything to have their service in the mosque because of the Ethiopian that took care of Muhammad when he was in the desert. So can you imagine how many churches back during Philip's day, if there was churches, obviously there wasn't yet, they were just starting, but I'm saying, can you imagine how many people would sponsor Philip today? Oh, oh, let me, let me help you. I want to support you, but they didn't see it then. So just because people don't see it doesn't mean it's not God's will. If God is calling you to do something, you need to follow God and not man because God's ways are not our ways. And we see that here with CT Stud. He goes from China to India, and now he's going to Africa. And I'm sure a lot of people disagreed with him and said, you need to stay in China. You know the language there. You need to just do what you, but God, God had other plans. And so we're going to continue. Let me... Let me throw it back up there, the screen. So we see here, it says, when in Africa, uh, uh, I'm sorry, well, back in England, he was inspired many people. This time, the Lord led him to Africa. Though he faced many trials from fever, funding denied twice due to his health, C.T. Studd said, as quoted in the book, Heroes, Christian Heroes, Then and Now, gentlemen, God has called me to go, and I will go. I will blaze the trail though my grave may only be a stepping stone that younger men may follow. Jesus tells us that he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And if I lose my life following Jesus, so be it. Well, that shows you how serious he was about the work of God. And not only was he serious, another thing I believe an ingredient of why God used him so greatly is because he recognized that the ministry was not just about him. There's a lot of men that God are using in a mighty way all around the world. But what happens is when they die, they do not train or disciple somebody to continue. And because they don't disciple to continue, what they did in life dies. And God is not for that. God wants us to be training younger people under us. If you have a young man, if you have a son, if you have a person in your church, you say, ah, God can't use him right now. God can use him doing something. Let them help you. You know, I've got a six-year-old daughter. My six-year-old daughter, she'll go clean the dishes. She'll make beds. She'll do anything she can to help me, and she wants to. But you know what we do a lot of times as parents? We say, oh, you, you're too young. You're too young. You're too young. And then guess what? When they turn 12, 13, 14 years old, they don't want to help because you made them not want to help. If when they're young, if you'll encourage them in the same way with a new Christian, uh, a Hindu man gets saved and he's excited. Oh, what can I do, pastor? What can I do to help the church? The Lord changed me. But you know what we do? Oh, you can't do anything yet. You're too young. You're too young. I'm not saying make him a pastor. He needs to learn. But I am saying give him something. Otherwise, what's going to happen is he's going to leave because he's going to say, well, I guess God can't use me. Everybody wants to be used by God. Everyone wants to be able to say God can use me too. And so be mindful of that. And that's what he said. He said, I, it's not about me. I'm just a stepping stone. There's going to be men that come after me. Can I tell you, uh, all these men here that I'm, that I'm standing here before, and I hope I get to meet each and every one of you personally someday, be able to go see you and shake your hand. But can I tell you, every one of you is because C.T. Studd was willing to go to India. William Carey was willing to go to India. And they recognized that what I do is nothing compared to what Miller Keeshing is going to do and what Red Mai is going to do and what Vijay is going to do and Katie Singh is going to do and Pastor Rajan. What I'm doing is little compared to what you can do. 
And that's if we will continue to just keep pushing forward and forward for Christ, encouraging others to continue on. Man, I'm telling you, the thing missing today is not knowledge. We've got all the knowledge in the world. What we miss today is encouragement. We can do it, fellas. We can reach India with the gospel. We can reach Myanmar with the gospel. You don't need big churches. You just need that heart of love and encouragement, discipleship, and you can make it. People are going through hard times. Churches are being burned down. Wives are, are dying. Uh, pastor wives are dying and going to heaven, and that can be discouraging. Just one, just one word of encouragement could, in, could change India into a Christian country. And that's what this man recognized. Now let's keep reading. It says when Africa, when in Africa, he began working with nationals in Nairobi, Kenya. Then he traveled with a caravan up to Sudan, where he discovered that many of the tribes that were unreached would be in the Congo region. This inspired him to return to England and recruit men that would be relentless in the mission work. Because of his straightforward approach while preaching, 24 young men volunteered to join him in his effort. These men would make up the heart of Africa mission, or what you would call ham. Upon returning to Africa, C.T. Studd was accompanied by his future son-in-law, Alfred. The two traveled to some of the most remote, remote portions of Africa with their goal being to start a mission work in tribes that had not yet been reached with the gospel. They started in the village of Dungu, where they met a Belgian man who offered land in Niangara to build a mission station. C.T. Studd writes in his journals shortly after building the mission station that they are in the most remote area in the heart of Africa. This central location in the vast unknown was a perfect station for many unreached tribes in that area. C.T. Studd then built three more mission stations, one to the south in Nala, one to the west in Poco, and another northwest uh, from Poco to Bambili. With four stations and now only five missionaries from England, C.T. Studd needed more people to reach the eight previously unreached tribes with the gospel. So it wasn't it wasn't that he didn't have places, as you see here. He has eight tribes that they could start a mission station. They could start a little church, but he doesn't have enough missionaries. He only has five. And so it was agreed upon that Alfred would stay with the oncoming, incoming missionaries while C.T. Stubb would go back to England, and he would use his cricket testimony to once again recruit more soldiers for Christ. So here, God knew what he was doing. God used this sport to help him encourage young men to do what he was doing. This would prove to be more difficult because when C.T. Studd arrived back in England in April of 1915, World War I was currently taking place. And now everybody knows World War I, right? This was this shut everything down. In England, C.T. Studd began preaching messages of surrender to the Lord's calling for missions. Uh, he was not concerned for the great war on earth, but rather the great war on eternity. He was not content with lavish living or uh, luxury and grandiose big church buildings, but rather his contentment came with a strong desire to reach those most destitute of God. And I do want to say this real quick. I want you, I, I, I deal with many nationals all around the world. Uh, like I said, I, I just since uh, June, July, when I was in India with many of you, I've been to uh four different countries. Uh, this year alone, I'm going to 15 different countries. <clears throat> One of the things I've recognized, not with every national, but with a lot of nationals. So there's this understanding in their mind, and it's a, mis it's a misunderstanding. It's not a good understanding. But this understanding that if I can have a big church building, then God can bless. The problem with a big church building is there's big attacks from Satan. The bigger you are, the stronger the attack will be. Fellas, don't get consumed with the ideas of if I have a lot of money or if I have a big church building, then God can use me. Listen, the Bible clearly says what interests God. God is not interested in your money. God owns your money. God is not interested in a big building. The Bible said, remember when, when Solomon built the temple? And they gave it to God and they said, now, God, aren't you pleased with this? Will you come down and live here and abide here in the temple? Remember what God said? God said, I will choose to dwell here if I choose to. 
Remember, God said, the earth is my footstool. Now understand, in Middle Eastern country, the foot is a nasty thing. You don't stick your foot out in front of people. And what God's saying here is, the earth is base. It's, 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 it's nothing. Like we think, oh, if I can own 600 hectares of land, I'll be so well known in India. And God said, it's trash to me. Like it's me that is important. It's not wealth. It's not buildings. It's not prosperity. If you want to truly be used of God, the Bible says the heart of God is to reach people that have never heard about the gospel. That's what C.T. Studd said. C.T. Studd said, I am not interested in money. He had all the money in the world. So don't take my word for it. Take it from a millionaire, a businessman. This man said, money means nothing. If you want to see things happen for God in a great way, then what you need to do is you need to start looking for people that have never heard about Jesus and start witnessing to them. Remember, I told you the story about Africa, South Africa. We were there. We did a VBS. We had about 46, 42, I know 42 at the beginning. And then the last day we had 96. Those 50 people came from, we found a little village. It's really just kind of a dump um, of, in, in South Africa, the majority of the people in South Africa are either white or they're Indian. I don't know if you know this, Durban, South Africa, is the largest city of Indian people in the world outside of India. It's huge. And they even have Hindu temples. And I mean, it looks like India, except for uh, a little bit uh, a little bit South Africa. But I mean, it, there's a lot of Indian uh, culture in there. But you know, what was interesting is the blacks in South Africa is not, there's not a lot of blacks. And the blacks come from other countries that are near, like Congo and Namibia, and they come as refugees. So many of them are homeless. And so there's this land that is really a trash site, and many of them stay there in like just cardboard boxes. And so the pastor there we were helping, he said, you know, my desire is to reach these people because they probably have never heard the gospel. Remember, I told you we went in there. A lot of the people asked us, what are y'all doing in here? You, you're not supposed to be in here. You're going to get hurt. You're, you're, you're not black. You're, not, you're white. You're easy. You look like you have money. Well, what does the Bible say? Don't take money with you. We, we understood all these things. So we went in so that if we do get robbed, all they're going to do is take our clothes. That's all we had. And they kept saying over and again, why are you here? Why are you here? And we told them, because we want to tell you about how to go to heaven. Well, guess what? We ended up getting... Uh, a gun put to us. We were robbed, but we didn't have anything. And the village rose up and they said, if you're willing to come here and to be a blessing to us, we're going to listen to what you say. Guess what? The next day we came back, even after we got uh, robbed, even though we had nothing. And the people were so surprised. They said, what are you doing back? And we said, we're not going to let some robbery scare us. We have God. And guess what happened? It was because of that, that 50 people came to the VBS. You see, that wasn't money. We didn't pay them anything. It wasn't a big building. It was God. When you take care of what God wants you to take care of, God blesses. And C.T. Studd said here, look, I'm not interested in money. I'm not interested in big things. I'm interested in the world getting the gospel. And as you'll read, and as we continue this curriculum throughout this semester, you're going to see that uh, that was that's how it was with all, all the men. The men were interested in getting people the gospel. And so we continue to read here. Let me throw it back up the screen. Um, it says here, uh, he was not content with all this. C.T. Studd once said while thundering from a pulpit, he was preaching and he said, Christ does not want nibblers of the possible. What does the word nibble mean? I don't know if you are familiar with it. Nibble means to eat a little bit, just on the edge, to taste it. C.T. Sud said, Jesus Christ doesn't want nibblers of the possible, but grabbers of the impossible. Some wish to live within the sound of a church or a chapel. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. So what he was saying here is many people want to stay in their church building and they want to be comfortable and they want people to come to them so that they can tell them about Jesus. And C.T. Studd said, no, I'm going to go to them. 
And if they kill me, it's okay. I'm going to heaven. Heaven's better than where I'm at right now. And because of this, that's why God used them so mightily. We see here finally by June 1916, 18 more, I mean, eight more people had volunteered to help with the missions in Central Africa. Upon arrival, Alfred was pleased to report to C.T. Studd that over 60 people had been baptized in Nala and many village chiefs were requesting for mission stations to be established in their villages. The first church service C.T. Studd attended after arriving back from England, 200 villages were in attendance. This blessed C.T. Studd's heart because when he left for England, there was not any evidence. And now God's word was permeating even the darkest region. So when he left for England, there was nobody going to church. And now there's 200 people coming to church. So that's a blessing. 81 additional converts were waiting for C.T. Stud to baptize them. And after confirming that each one of them understood how to go to heaven, the step they were taking for Christ, C.T. Stud gladly and with tears baptized each and every one of them. Within a few weeks, 20 of the new baptized converts assembled for a meeting to go and reach other villages with the gospel. These soul winners would be given three months wage if they used it efficiently for the necessity of food. Several of the converts wanted to stay out longer than a year, even 18 months. But listen, I want you to see this. This, is, this, this shows you the power of God. Okay, look at what it says here. They originally gave them three months wage. I don't know how much you get a day in a, or say a month in India, but let's make it practical. An average month, how much would an average month's wage? Now, they're giving them three, three months to go uh, to go out and to the, do the work. And look what happened. Several of the people that were saved, the, the soul winners, the church planners, they wanted to stay out longer than a year. Now, let me ask you a question. Three months wage. And they're staying out for a year. That's a long time. It says even 18 months, a year and a half on three months of wages. But listen to this testimony of what God promises to us. But upon their arrival, many would come back with the same amount of money they left with and stories about how good God was providing for their every need. Now, listen, listen, folks, please listen. I'm grateful to be able to partner and to sponsor missionaries and pastors and help with works. But I only, me, I only give if God puts it on my heart to give. Because money can be a blessing, but it can also be a vice. It can be a trap. So many people get consumed with money that they forget to do the work of God. Recognize what it said here. It says here that these men were given three months wage. And then they would come back 18 months later and they would still have the money that they left with because the Bible promises that God will take care of his servants. He always does. Now, he may not give us necessarily what we want. Sometimes we want, uh, you know, the, the uh, chicken curry and all we get is dull. But can I tell you, just because it's not what we want, it's always what we need. And sometimes I think that we get so comfortable that God can't use us when God knows what he's doing. And these people will tell you stories. I'll tell you a story of me personally. Again, the way I do missions is different. Like most missionaries go to a country and they stay there most of the time, the rest of their life. And when you go from church to church raising support, most churches will get behind that and they'll support that. When I surrender to missions, I used to work for uh, a truck company, the big trucks, and I would deliver food into restaurants. And I made very good money. I made a hundred thousand U.S. dollars a year. Uh, I didn't need any. I, we would eat at fancy restaurants every day. I, we were we we had no need of money, but I was miserable. And I told my wife, I'm miserable because I do not need God. I don't have to pray and ask God for anything because I just do it myself. And I was miserable. When God called me to be a missionary, I quit my job overnight. I just quit it. And when I quit my job, I told God, I said, God, I'm going to be your servant. If I'm your servant, I need you to help me. And can I tell you, I went from church to church. And you know what the churches said? They said, no, I don't want to support you. You're not doing missions the right way. You're supposed to be a missionary in one country. You're not a missionary in one country. I will not support you. 
And so my wife, she would tell me, she said, honey, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going to keep trusting God. God told me this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm not supposed to listen to people. I'm supposed to listen to God. And can I tell you, in time, God took care of us. I I can tell you, I've looked, looking back, I have never, never gone forsaken. Dr. Victor knows of a specific situation that happened during the time we were there. There were some finance issues that took place um, that I was not aware of, that I would have to take care of, and that uh, I wasn't expecting. But guess what? There's a philosophy I have, and the philosophy I have is I never let money divide me from people. I never do. And that what I ended up uh, what I ended up making a decision a long time ago is people are more important than money. And so I, with this particular situation, I took it upon myself. And I, uh, even though I didn't have the funds, I took care of it. And guess what happened? When I came back, you know what? There was an individual that came to me and said, you know, God put on my heart to give you some love money. And can I tell you, the money was exactly the same amount of money that I had to pay to take care of the situation. Now, let me explain again, this money I wasn't supposed to pay. This money was a situation that was understood, but other circumstances happened. And so now I'm the one that's having to pay it. I don't have it. Just because I'm American doesn't mean that I have money hanging off my trees in my backyard, but God takes care of his servants. I'm reminded, I remember, when I was in the Philippines, they would go and get me water when I was preaching. And when I was uh, in the Philippines going and uh, preaching, I would watch this young boy. And I want you to take this and, and I want you to remember this personally in your life. Here's this young boy. And the pastor of the church would tell the young boy, he would say, hey, son, go to the market and get me three bottles of water. Now, let me ask you a question. Did the young boy have to pay for the water? No. Who paid for it? The master. The pastor. The young boy just had to be willing. If you are in the ministry today and God has put you there, then God will take care of you. God always takes care of his servants. The Bible says if an evil father gives good gifts to his children, how much more would your heavenly father? So take hope in that. You say, oh, I don't know how I'm going to make it today. Listen, if you knew how you're going to make it today, then you wouldn't need God. Sometimes God gives us hard times because he wants us to talk to him. Remember when you were a teenager and your mom and dad wanted you to talk to them? And so they would take away a toy or they would take away something from you to make you have to come to them and say, hi, mom, how are you this morning? That's how God is. God doesn't want you to work for him just because he's a businessman. God wants you to have a relationship with him and he wants you to trust him and rely on him. So there's times even with me, I told God this year, my wife, well, actually I didn't, my wife did. My wife was an encouragement, but not an encouragement. At the beginning of the year, my wife said, Hey, every meeting that you're invited to this year, let's, let's tell God we won't turn it down. Well, I've only been invited one time. So I told my wife, okay, we'll do that. And guess what? I was invited this year 12 times. Well, I did not have 12 times worth of money at all. But God knew what he was doing. And listen, God's taking care of me. I was on a plane heading to um, India. Actually, I was heading to India. Uh, Dr. Victor was supposed to pick me up the day he went and picked up another brother. His name's Sam Castillo. We were supposed to arrive the same time. Guess what? My plane was rejected. It was canceled. And I had to, I think two days later is when I arrived in India. Well, guess what? I was frustrated because I'm supposed to be there on that day. But you know what the airline did? The airline gave me a free credit for another flight. God knew what he was doing. I didn't have the money to pay for the flight, but God gave me the opportunity through some problems on the one flight to be able to pay for the next flight. So don't get irritated with God. God knows what he's doing. And so that's an encouragement. What I'm saying is if you feel like, God, I'm just this little slave. I thought I'm your servant. I thought you take care of me. God always takes care of his children. If, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. 
You see, you've got to do what you're supposed to be doing. If a pastor tells a young boy to go get water and he says, no, I don't want to get water. Well, then he's not going to bless the young boy because he's not obeying. We have to be obedient to our master. But if we're obedient, he's a good master. He's a good father and he'll take care of us. And we see here, not just a testimony for me, how God has taken care of So let's finish up this portion here. Soon people came from all parts of Africa to Nala because they knew that this is the place where the knowledge of God would be found. Because of World War I taking place in Europe, C.T. Studd was having a harder time with getting missionaries to Africa. Now, why? Because a lot of them were being recruited to the military. And if the government, you know, you have to obey. Uh, Jesus said to obey man as well as God. You know, it, um, we we have a young man, he's in Thailand. He had to go to the military because it's the law or you go to jail. So he, he, went, he went to the military to, uh, to uh, he went to the military, but then when he got out, he became a missionary. And so, but at any rate, uh, C.T. Studd was having a hard time getting more missionaries. However, where England lacked in recruitments, God showed up in putting a desire in the hearts of the nationals to reach their own people. And listen, that you, I don't, if God calls you to uh, Nigeria, Africa, as a missionary, and you go there, your work is not complete until you have the Nigerian people with the desire to reach their people. Because what good is it to go to a country and to tell them about God if they don't believe, God can use them. Our desire is not to be better than anybody else. Our desire is to say God can use everyone. So we see here soon the Great War was over and fresh reinforcements and new missionaries began flooding in to help the mission stations in Central Africa. Alfred headed back with his wife, Edith, for furlough and to encourage more missionaries to surrender. Because of a greater vision to now reach the entire world, part of Africa Missions was renamed to Worldwide Evangelism Crusade, which is even still known today. It's called WEC, and many of you may have heard of that before. But in 1920, Alfred and his mother-in-law, Priscilla, began traveling the United States to recruit more missionaries and raise more support for Africa, as well as the Amazon in South America. In his entire life, C.T. Studd had never seen a group of people so open to the gospel like those in Central Africa that had been left in darkness for so long. They would complain when C.T. Studd would quit preaching. When's the last time you were preaching and your, your church said, oh, you're done? We want you to preach longer. Uh, very few people do I know that say that. Most of them say, oh, you preach too long. But these people in Africa, they told C.T. Studd, oh, you're finished? And they would beg him to continue just in case they missed something and was never able to learn it again. Multitudes were getting saved, and it wasn't uncommon for C.T. Studd to preach to groups of 2,000 people. By now, 40, 40 foreign missionaries were sent out from WEC to Central Africa, and there were three missionaries being sent to the Amazon. Um, and then you see a quote there. This is a quote from C.T. Studd. Christ's call is to save the lost, not the stiff neck. He came not to call scoffers, but sinners to repentance, not to build and furnish comfortable chapels, churches, and cathedrals at home in which to rock Christians' professors to sleep by means of clever essays. And uh, it says here, this can be accomplished only by red-hot preaching. Listen, sometimes I think we get so focused on preaching a sermon that's perfect that we don't have that fire. You know, when you when you preach a message, it should come from the heart. Because if it's not coming from the heart, then the people are not going to catch it. People can only catch zeal. They can only catch zeal. They don't catch words. They catch the fire in the heart. They catch the desire, the burden. Let's go tell people about Jesus. Let's reach the world. Let's give for the sake of the gospel. They're, they're, they're not interested in your knowledge. They're not interested in that. They are interested in passion, in fire. Why are you different? You know, in America during COVID, you know what happened? A lot of people started to say that church is not necessary. Church is not essential. You know why? Because church wasn't essential. 
Why go to church if you're no different than the world? Why go to church? You know, I know of a young man right now that told me, I'm not interested in church because what I learn in church, I can learn in my business. It's not just about learning. It's about passion. It's about fire. Did God change your life? Did he save you from hell? And if he saved you from hell, then there should be a desire to reach other people so that they don't go to hell as well. And when you have that fire, that fire is very um, addicting. Uh, what do you call it? It's contagious. It passes. And the fire will go on from people to people. So we need to be mindful of that. Now, I want you to look here. So we're done with that portion there. Let me see. Okay, I think you're seeing me right now. But let me let me go back to the screen because I'm going to show you lesson two. Hey, does everybody see their lesson two? And it says report. Okay, this is what I want you to do. I don't want you to rewrite what we read. Okay, that, that makes no sense. You already have that. What I want you to do is I want you to write a report. And you don't have to write it there. It's just, it's there to show you. But I want you to type or to write a report as to how did CT Studs life touch you? What are some things in CT's life that you learned that could be an encouragement to you and help you with the ministry? Uh, could it be his desire to literally, not just figuratively, but literally see the world saved? You know, he had such a desire that he went everywhere. You know, uh, let me encourage you. Many of you think, oh, Brother Bell, he goes to all these countries because he's American. Listen, and listen very well. I don't go to all these countries because I'm American. I go to all these countries because God called me. And when God calls, he equips and he gives the resources. Can I say right now, Aaron in Myanmar, if God calls you to reach the world in the same way that I'm reaching the world, can I tell you? that it's not because I'm American, it's because of God. God can give you the resources. God can give you the opportunity to do it just like I do it. Uh, Miller, the same way. Pastor Siwat, the same way. Uh, Vijay and Rajan and Samarpan and Pastor Wilson and main thing. If God calls a man, God equips a man. When God tells a servant to go fetch water, he gives them the money, the resources to acquire the water. Otherwise, listen, otherwise, the, the master looks like a fool. Can you imagine? Think with me. Let's say I'm this businessman, very famous, very wealthy, very well-known businessman in a village. Okay. One of the wealthiest in a small village. And let's say that I, I tell a young man, hey, go and get me some water. Okay. He goes over there. And he's in the market and the market says, what do you need? And I say, I need some water. And they could tell, obviously, I'm just a servant. So they said, who asked you to come get water? And I say, oh, the greatest businessman in the village asked me to get water. And so they say, oh, wow, really? The greatest businessman in the, in the village asked you to get water? Yes, he did. I need water. And so they give me the three water and they say that will be 50 rupee. And I say, well, I don't have any money. You know what would happen? That market would say, your businessman, the wealthiest man in the world, was not able to afford water? What kind of businessman is that? You see, not only will God equip you, but God has to equip you. Otherwise, he looks foolish. Remember what the Bible says? That if you go on behalf of God, God will take care of you. Why? Because if you go around the world saying that I am a minister of God, and then the world sees, well, okay, if you're a minister of God, then why isn't God taking care of you? Then that that's not, you don't look bad. God looks bad. Because God's the one that has the money. He's the, he's the businessman. He's the master. So here it is. God's not just going to call you. If God tells you to go get water, he's going to give you the money to go get the water. He's not going to look like a fool. God's not going to be the person that sits there and then everybody in the market, everybody in India. You know why I think partly India does not take Christianity seriously. You know why? Because I think there's a lot of servants that are afraid to step out by faith 
because they don't see it. Well, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how I'm going to get the money. Many times God's will is not by sight, it's by faith. When you take that step of faith, then God provides because then it shows that God is powerful. So just be mindful, please. If there's something in your heart right now that God is speaking to you on for him, do not think, well, I need money. No, you need God. And listen, if it's not there yet, if you don't have it yet, the resources to do what God has called you to do because you're not close enough to God yet. You, God wants you to talk to him more. God wants you to get alone with him more because he knows that the task you're going to do is a very hard task and you're going to need to be close to him to be able to handle it because when Satan sees you living by faith, he's going to try to destroy you. So don't let money, don't let all that foolishness, oh, I'm American, I need the money from America. You know, the Philippines right now is sending more missionaries than America. Because the Filipinos realize the God of America is as powerful as the God of the Philippines. It's the same God. And if we will obey, then we can be used of God just as much. And now today, it's a shame. The Philippines, uh, just a little island that had no Christianity at the beginning, now they're sending more missionaries. Could that not be the same as India and Myanmar and Burma, uh, Nepal? Pakistan, if we were to say, let's quit making excuses, it's an excuse. God, if he calls you, you know if he's calling you. And if he's called you, God will be with you. What did the Bible say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because God will be with you. So it's an excuse. And you're only hurting yourself and the cause of Christ because everybody in the village, everybody in your community knows you're running from God. Everybody knew Jonah was running. Everyone knew when people were not living for God the way they should. And so what I'm saying here is this lesson two, it's just, it's an illustration. But what I want you to do is I want you to write, not a long, not a long one. You have the big report. You have the big report that I want you to do of one of the missionaries other than William Carey. So it can be CT stud. That one is going to be the final report. This one here is not really a report. It's more like a write a paragraph or a two paragraphs short of how was this a help to me personally? Because again, what good is it to go through these lives if it's not personal? Okay, does that make sense? So just a short, I would say not even more than, not even more than 200 words, something like 100 words of just, just a short, this is what is encouraging to me so that later on, when you're going through a hard time, you can go back through these stories and you can look at how it helped you with this man's life, and then you can go and look at his life again. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So that's going to be your assignment for next week. So next week, have that completed. Give it to Dr. Victor or whoever you need to give it to. Again, it's short. It shouldn't take you more than 15 minutes. It's just, how did this help me in my life? Okay? And then give it to me. The only reason why I'm wanting to see it is so that I can see that you're that you actually did it. But I'm not even really going to grade it. I just want you to I want to hear on from your heart how this man's life was a blessing to you so that I can also cuz a lot of times I'll re I'll redo the lessons and re re-edit and revise them and if I feel like there's maybe a personality that's missing I could add another one in. So there's that. Okay, let's move on to lesson number 3. Let me get it back up on the screen. Now, this lesson is going to be fill in the blank, okay? So you're going to have to take notes. Now, if you don't have it all printed out, it's okay, because what you can do is um, you can, uh, you know, just take the word and then maybe fill it out later if you don't have the whole copy, uh, but just take the portion. So here's the first part here, all right? Lesson three, does everybody see it? Yes. Okay, so here we go. Number one, so these are just practical. What I've done is I've gone through this, their, their life, and I've taken some things that I thought were uh, unique about their life. So number one, the calling. So the blank there is the calling for your book. Or if you want to take notes. Again, if you want to, let's say you don't have the deal, maybe on a piece of paper, just write calling. Put number one, calling, so that you can fill it in later. Because you're not going to get this one. This one has all the blanks already filled. You're not going to get this one. So make sure to write these down for your test. Otherwise, you, you'll be in trouble. 
So the calling. And again, like I said, if you don't have it, just get a piece of paper, just a, a normal piece of paper. Right, number one, calling. Okay, oh, yeah, just, just wait on there. Let me, let me grab a pen and paper. Okay, no problem. And we're not going to get too far into this because uh, it's just lesson. We're already in lesson three, but um, uh, but we'll we'll go ahead and start on a little bit just in case a lesson takes a little bit longer. I hope it's been a, a blessing so far. It's a little different to how I teach. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Victor remembers. Uh, I tend to be very expositional in my uh, teaching but it's hard to be expositional on a biography. Sometimes biographies are kind of a little more dry. And that's why I did it like I did right here on lesson three, maybe to make it a little more expositional so it's not as, uh, I guess, boring. It's not that it's boring. Everybody knows it's just, it, it's a lot of information. And so. Yes, we are ready. Ready. All right, here we go. Number one, the calling of God on C.T. Studd's life. Okay, Romans eleven twenty nine for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So the blank there is without repentance. Again, a lot of these are going to be test questions. And I'll give you a review, but it, it'd be helpful for you to have the blanks already. But the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. What does repentance mean? Well, it means change of mind. You, If God called you, you can't later on say, oh, well, you know, I changed my mind. No, you didn't change your mind. God God doesn't change his mind. I'm the Lord God has changed not. If he called you, then it's his will. Jonah wanted to change his life, and that didn't happen. Look at the next one, Matthew 6, 33, 34. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, let me, let me say here, that's going back to what I was talking about. Seek ye first. Do, many of you want to be used of God. You wouldn't be in seminary if you didn't want to be used of God. Absolutely, you want to be used of God. But here is how you're used of God. I don't care what men, what men say. I'm interested in what God says. God says in Matthew, all these things will be added unto you if you seek first the kingdom of God. Now, how do you seek God's kingdom? By seeing the souls of people saved. God is not interested in you becoming the smartest person in knowing the Bible. Although you need to know the Bible so that you can be able to give an answer for anything somebody has a question about. But what good is it to have all the answers if people are not being converted and, and salvaged from hell? God wants people saved. God would not have sent his son to die for us if it couldn't save everyone. God wants everyone saved. But we have to have that heart that God has. God says if you will take care of the kingdom of God and advance the kingdom of God, God will give you the resources. But a lot of times we get it backwards. We seek first the things that, and then we expect God to bless us. And God said, no, you're doing it the wrong way. You have to do it my way. And then he even, just in case you didn't understand, he, he re, reinforces it by saying, don't even worry about tomorrow. We're so worried about tomorrow. I know a lot of preachers that are praying, oh, God, please give me a building that's the size of one million U.S. dollars. But here's my question. The Bible says God may come back tonight. So why are we worried about a church building for tomorrow if it's not even going to be here tomorrow? Everything's going to be burned up. But you know what won't be here tomorrow? The opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus and to save them from hell. That's what God's interested in. He's not interested in you having a beautiful church building. Because the Bible says tomorrow will take care of itself. If you'll do what you're supposed to be doing, I'm not saying you shouldn't have nice things. I'm saying if you take care of God, God will take care of you. If you, if, if, if I have two servants and I ask both of them to go do something and one of them is a lazy servant, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give the, the hardworking servant more stuff, more blessings because they take care of me. So be mindful of that. Don't get consumed with this idea that America is successful because we have big buildings. That is not true. 
if America is successful spiritually, it's because we have a desire to see people be saved. And it's the same way everywhere else. And then if you do that, then God will bring people along. Have you not seen this before in your own personal life? I've seen it. I'll go out and witness to people so that we can have people added to the church. And those people that I talk to all day, none of them come to the church, none of them. But because I obeyed God and I sought first the kingdom of God and told people about Jesus, you know what happened? Some person that I don't even know comes to the church and they say, hey, I found your church online or somebody told me about your church. Remember what Jesus said? If you will be focused on the work, God will send the laborers. You want people to help you with your ministry? Then you get focused on the work. Which one? Here's an old famous uh, illustration. Which one will get more helpers? Let's say your car breaks down. Which one will get more helpers? You standing by your car and saying, hey, come help me. My car is broke down. I need you to help me push it. Or you start pushing the car and people see that you're struggling and then they come by to help you. Which one's going to get more help? You working because people like to help people that are working. They don't like to help people that are just sitting. So if you want more people helping you in your ministry, then get to work. Seek the kingdom of God and quit worrying about the finances. The finances will come. The help will come when people see that you're serious. Businessmen invest in people that are hard workers. They don't invest in people. Uh, you know, you know, Bill Gates, right? The guy that invented the computer. Bill Gates said this about his business. He said, when I hire people to work for my business, he said, I don't worry about if you don't know how to work on computer, it's okay. I can pay for that. That's easy. If you don't know how to work on computer, I can train you. If you don't know how to uh, how to uh, uh, work on vehicle, I can train you. If you don't know how to speak a language, I can train you. There's one thing I cannot train, and it's the heart. It's a work at it's character. I can't train that. If you don't know how to be a hard worker, I can't train that. If you're a hard worker, I can train you to do anything. God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now, let's look at the illustration here, and then that's going to be about it for today. But let me go back to it. We'll do this just this first one here. It says, on Saturday, November 1st, 1884, C.T. Studd felt the Lord's call on his life to go to China after hearing missionary John McCarthy's testimony of working in China. We heard about that a little bit. And knowing of thousands of Chinese were dying without hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the blank there is Lord Jesus Christ. This call burned in his heart for the next two weeks as he prayed for boldness. So here he is, he's praying and he's asking God, God, give me boldness. Why am I not reaching people? John McCarthy's reaching thousands. He's telling thousands of people about you. Why am I not? But look, finally, the time had arrived that C.T. Studd could not hold it in. And he had to tell his widowed mother. His mother was horrified. And his uncle kept telling Charles that his life was being thrown away. Because remember, he was still playing cricket, making lots of money. And it's just, it's burning. And he said, I got to be a missionary. I got to be a missionary. So he went and told his mom. His mom doesn't, his, his father has already passed away. His mom's by herself. She's horrified because she wants him to stay there to help her. The uncle keeps telling him, you're throwing your life away. How many times have you heard this in your life? Maybe when you were a young man before you became a minister or before you went to seminary. How many times have you heard this? Son, why don't you just go get a business, make money, and help a church? But that's not how God works. God wants you to give him your heart, and then God will give you everything that you need. And that's what he's saying. His, his uncle's saying, Charles, why don't you just keep playing cricket? Make lots of money. Just give money to missionaries. Give money to missionaries. That wouldn't have worked. You know why? Because it was C.T. Studd's heart. It was his life that was being used to influence people. It wasn't the money. Money doesn't do anything. It's the heart of a person that changes the lives of another heart. But it says here that his life was thrown away. Christians around England tried to convince C.T. Studd to stay and do ministry work locally. How many times have you heard? Maybe God wants you to go to another village and start a church and they tell you, no, no, stay here, stay here. You need to stay here. You're a blessing here. You Anything that is not God's will is sin. 
If God wants you to be in China and you're in India right now, and God wants you to be in China, you are sinning against God because it is about God's will. It's not a, what does the Bible say? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And so we see Christians around England try to convince Charles to stay. Even his brother who started the Bible club asked C.T. Studd to stay in England. But look here, one night asking God for peace. He didn't want his mom. C.T. Studd was big on family. He didn't want his mom and dad mad. He didn't want his brothers mad. So he asked God for peace. God, give me peace. I don't want to be mean, but I know you're calling me to go. And when he asked God for peace, he was reading his Bible. Can I tell you, if you're struggling with something right now, the best thing sometimes to do is ask God for help and then go get in the Bible and read the Bible. And he said in Psalms 2.8, it said, ask of me. And that was his answer. He's asking God, God, what should I do? And what did God say? Ask me. Don't worry about anybody else. And the Bible says, I shall give you the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, the blankest possession. And so again, we see here a very powerful part. This man, no doubt, could have given millions of U.S. dollars to mission works all around the world. But that's not what God wanted him to do. God wanted him to give his life. And because God gave, because he gave his life, God used him in a greater way. So let's always be reminded by that. And at that time, I'm going to go ahead and have to start winding it down so I can head over to my other classes. But again, I'm thankful that we're able to make this happen. Uh, we had a different time plan, but it just wasn't going to work. Uh, but this one is, seems to be working very beautifully for me. I hope it's working great for you. And uh, I look forward to the weeks that are to come. And again, like I said, hopefully I meet you in person. Uh, I like seeing real faces, not just computer faces, uh, because there's uh, 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 it's more personal. And so it's a blessing, Dr. Victor. Thank you again for letting me be a part of this. It's a blessing. You mean a lot to me. I'm glad I got to meet you. And uh, hopefully, Lord willing, I get to see you uh, sometime uh, next year. And uh, I'll talk to you about that uh, in the future. All right. Any questions? No, sir. I will see y'all next time. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Great. <laughs>